Welcome to FinTalk, a We Entertainment production. My name is Efefi Ongakban. I launched my international screenwriting uh, service with her motivation. 13 years later, after establishing her company in 2009, she is an award-winning director and producer in her own right. She recently produced an award-winning animation television miniseries inspired by the NAACP, the Association of Color People, uh, that gave an award to a book titled Nelson and the last favorite hotels. This was reflect the eternal desire to make African filmmaking folklore stand up. Motivated especially by let Raul Adila, Mandela's native name, which means spin or shake the branches of a tree. Indeed, he did through his lifetime. You know, that's what Mandela said. It is my wish that the voice of the storyteller would never die in Africa. That all the children of the world may experience the wonder, the wonder of African storytelling, which basically used to be moonlit, you know, in villages. I don't know if it's still happening now, but I know that it, when I was a young person, a young boy, we used to have, have a, you know, moonlit storytelling by elder. So my guest today on Film Talk is Gloria Noble Arif, an attorney, a producer, and a director. And it is so also a philanthropist. So you're welcome, Gloria. Thank you very much, and I'm privileged to be here tonight. Uh, I'm basically going to be we're basically going to be talking about your TV mini TV series, which is very interesting. Like I said, it will underpin Pan African folklore filmmaking, which would make Mandela very proud in his grave. I'm very sure of that. <laughs> so, so, so why we talk about your philanthropic strides? I suspect you're doing better at protecting your intellectual property or movie assets than most of all would attempt. Is that true or false? Regretfully false. You know what they say, the mechanic's own car is always broken. Similarly, knowing the injustice of our legal system, being an attorney, one does not always take proper care of your own legal affairs. You're always worried about your clients' matters. I have certainly slipped up in some instances, but it does give you an advantage when you need to do the uh, take any legal action against anyone in particular, because you know you you have the access to uh, to other attorneys who are in the field. And I've had that um, happen to me actually on occasion where I needed to take certain action, and I was actually able to do that because I was an attorney, and I was then able to protect my intellectual property. Um, you just said it could be dicey, it could be tricky in Nigeria. And recently, we've had people, you know, expressing concerns about copywriting in uh, creative assets. What advice do you give to Nigerians? Well, you know, in terms of the Copyright Act, you're supposed to post the document to yourself so that you have a postal address uh, um, time in which it was posted to you, and you can say, "This was the date in which I posted it to myself." Therefore, can you see it is copywritten on this date? But now, you know, the act needs to be updated because we don't even use the post office anymore. Oh, yeah. But we do have a, a, a copyright registry office where you can submit your script to the registry office and then they can keep it there and say that they've received the script on this particular date and they register it in the office. So it's almost like a registration process. And then at, if you want to prove that I registered my script that was exactly like this on that date at the registry office you can go to the registry office and you get um the proof that you have copywritten your script but you know as i said sometimes there's a lot of injustice in the law you can actually do that and somebody can still take your idea and they can still go and write a script and change a certain bit of the dialogue and say to you no the story that you are telling is in the public domain and because it's a story in the public domain, you don't have a right to that story. And then they can only change a few things in your script and still take your story and you don't have a leg to stand on. But you could anyway try to fight it. I, I had a circumstance like that. At the end, um, it was kind of a, it could go my way or their way. And so we rather uh, came to an, a settlement agreement because you never know what happens in the court of law anyway. Well, from answer. my personal experience, I find a solution where somebody will give me an idea okay it'll be like i want a story about a pig and I'll, okay pig is universal it's everywhere and i'll go and put a story around a pig and it's like 
I have the right to your story because I told you about the story of around a pig. Is that a pig? Is that how do you handle that? Yeah, that's the thing, you see. So, I mean, everyone can tell a story about a pig. It's just the actual dialogue. So, did you copy this person's dialogue? I once had a, a person who told me somebody stole their script. And they were just waiting for that movie to come out. And if one word, you know, one, well, it had to be a phrase. It couldn't be a word. One phrase was exactly the same as her phrase in her script. She was going to nail them. I didn't hear her again about what happened. I guess they changed every, every line. So the story is about the pig, but it's the dialogue, which must then be completely different. Then the person has no right. But if somebody steals your line, that would be, you know, that they've infringed on your copyright. Uh, from all indications, law seems to come naturally to you. So, so when did law, when did law allow you a foot room to begin to venture into filmmaking? Well, you know the thing is, I practice on my own account, which means I'm the boss. So therefore, it's easy for me to take off work, and uh, when I needed to go to auditions or anything, or even just take off a week to make a film. I also have an excellent support staff in my law office who keep the fires going even in my absence. But yes, it is very demanding, and I put in long hours, early mornings and late nights. Yeah, I would agree with you because I mean, having featured in about three films, one of them being Baby Mamas. I was imagining how would she have spent time. But I know that you have stage experience, stage acting experience. Is that true? Yes, I do have stage acting. Well, not really stage experience, much of that. I have more sort of, I did a diploma in, in drama and um, for four years with Tani Malalo. I also studied in Hollywood. Um, I went there for a month and I studied with Margie Haber. And her call to fame is that she trained The Rock. So I was trained by the trainer of The Rock. And there were a lot of international students who came to uh, to Los Angeles for that uh, month training. I met people from Germany and from the United Kingdom. And I did that training then. And then at, at, at home, you know, we do presenting training. And in terms of the film, I've, I've gone to training with the National Film and Video Foundation and attended several workshops. Um, recently, um, uh, I uh, joined the Franklin Players and we just put on a state production. And I must add that the production that I was in, it won best production, best ensemble, best script, and, and best lead actress and best director. <laughs> so it was absolutely a fabulous experience. I haven't been on the stage for 25 years since uh, doing my drama course with Tani Miller when we you know, did it for our exams. Um, it was the first time that I'd done something a little more professional and I, it was absolutely wonderful. I enjoyed it very much. Impressive for somebody who read law and is naturally talented artist. <laughs> so, I, I looked through your uh, lookbook of press kits or sales brochure and it revealed to me a sense of direction, a sense of purpose. How, how, how did that influence come from the overall conception of the project? you know, in terms of the animation series? Well, you know, whenever you're looking for funding, it's absolutely imperative that you put together um, your proposal. And, and your proposal is like what they, they call it a Bible, you know, and it's your concept as to what it is that you, you want to do. So you cannot go out and look for funding without thinking your story through completely. What are your characters? How would your characters be portrayed? What are the what are the characteristics of your characters? What is the look and feel of, of your story? What is the world of your story? Um, what would be your backgrounds and, and, and how would your characters be looking? So your, 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 your Bible or your lookbook must be done completely conceptualized before you commence with your production because that's when you're actually looking for your funding. And if you do have the time, you know, it's even good to do a little trailer or a pilot when you're putting together your whole, your whole concept. I mean, I, I know about Big Tech, uh, but I also know that a lot of us in Africa talk about funding. We cry, we don't have sources of funding. And that could be a very, you know, uh, uh, I mean, formal way or right way of producing, presenting your projects for production or for funding. But is it that easy in South Africa? Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> Just for an example, <laughs> when I started my production company in 2009, I wanted to uh, obviously get funding for a feature film. And up to today, 13 years later, 
I still don't have the funding for that feature film that I started my business with. The first uh, stumbling block I got was, in order for you to get funding for a feature film, you must have produced a short film. And because I never went to film school, I didn't even have a short film behind my name. So I quickly got a team together and we did a short film. And our short film was so popular. That's when I met you, when I was out there in Nigeria, when our film won a most outstanding uh, short film. And it did so well. And from there, uh, we then continue. OK, now we've done a short film. So we submitted the application for funding. But you start with development funding first because you need to develop your script. So we had the, did the development funding part. We, we got the money. We developed the script. The script was ready. Now, of course, you need money to produce the script. So then we apply to produce the script. And then there are certain things. You must have a, um, a, a cinema like a Stekini Core or New Metro needs to say that when this film is produced, they will actually exhibit it. So that was a huge challenge to get those letters. Uh, or even with my animation, I needed to get a, a television station because it's a television series to say that when this animation was done, they would license it. If I don't have those letters, I won't even be looked at for, uh, for funding. And it's really difficult for filmmakers to actually get those letters. So I battled for a long time with my feature film to get it. But while I was, you know, like I always say to filmmakers, you can, you can battle for 13 years like I have to make the feature film, but don't just battle for the feature film. Do other little things in between. And that's what I did. I did the made for TV movies for Mizanzi. I did four of those. I did a, a, a feature film that we thought might get to stay in Core, but they never accepted it because they said our budget was too low. So we didn't have production value in it. But the thing is, we, we made it. We did it. We didn't sit 13 years have passed. I still don't have the funding for the feature film and I've done nothing. No, 13 years have passed. I've worked on my big feature film, the big cinema blockbuster. I'm still not there yet. But in the meantime, I've done all of this. So that's the important part when you, you know, when you're looking for funding, it's really difficult. But with the animation, uh, we were fortunate that uh, we met a gentleman uh, called Nanda Subin, who was a very well-known, famous cartoonist, internationally re recognized. And so the KZN, um, the KwaZulu Natal Film Commission, gave us money uh, for, the, uh, for the development and production of this, for the animation. So, so, so that, you know, we were fortunate to get the money, but it wasn't even nearly the amount of money that we needed. And that's why, even though I had 30 stories in the book, I was only able to produce six because we didn't get sufficient money to do, do more. But hopefully now that the six are out and if the six do well, you know, we can go back and say, can we have some more money, please? You know, because we've, we've proved ourselves with the little ones. They wouldn't give us 60 million, but they were prepared to give us like 4 million, you know, that kind of scenario. I, so, I, yes, I, yes. Am, I am really intrigued because, I mean, I would also give, give it to South Africa where you have seriously organized filmmaking sector. Do you believe that, I mean, organization of the industry in your country must have sort of given you some level of credibility and integrity to go approach international bodies of funding? Well, with the uh, the uh, feature film that I'm busy with, it, it actually did help us because the National Film and Video Foundation gave us sort of like, you know, th they don't give you the whole budget. They, they, they approved the development, then they approved the production because I had all the criteria, I got the letters that I required. But then I need to go and find my gap funding. So then they send us overseas to festivals where we met um, co-producers from the Netherlands. And they even have film festivals like the Durban International Film Festival, where the Netherlands film fonts and, and people from all over the world would come to Durban and meet with filmmakers who can then pitch their project, products. So we currently have a signed production, co-production agreement with the Netherlands. So now we're just needing that little gap money. You yeah. know, we still have the gap, you know, to, to, to make the film. But but yes, I would say because of the National Film and Video Foundation and the KZN Film Commission, you know, they do definitely want, once they develop your project, once they approve your production, they do try to help you to get, you know, other co-productions and to be able to approach international companies. But the challenge is still, they don't fill the gap. And because we are still needing to fill the gap, I'm sitting here 13 years later, still not being able to make my film. Well, I'm still talking to Claudia Nobulare, an attorney, philanthropist, award-winning director, producer. Is She's also a folklorist filmmaker. I mean, given the fact that she's producing a pan-African culture, folklore, you know, 
animation series. So let me go back to Nelson Mandela. How so deeply has he, been, has he inspired you, you know, from time? How did he inspire you? How did he build up your zeal, uh, your, your zeal to make movies, mm -hmm. you, you know? If I make movies that are Pan-African in terms of folklore, Okay, so, so what, what really, my, my the, the inspiration to make this particular um, uh, African folk tales was that, you know, when I finished the short film, and the short film was about a, a 10 year old girl, and I saw, oh gosh, you know, uh, children's stories are actually quite interesting. And I started searching on the internet to look for uh, children's stories. And I came across the book. And immediately when I saw the book, I said, oh, this is by Madiba, it's African folktales. And I mean, we grew up on folktales, Cinderella, Snow White, um, uh, Goldilocks, those are all folktales. And I said, but like, and these are all the stories that Disney has been telling and animating all these years. And I had a very keen interest in, so we have African folktales? And I mean, amazing, one of my, my the folktales in the book, because immediately I saw it, African folktales, Nelson Mandela, I purchased the book and I read it. And the one story, for example, Snake Chief, is exactly the same as Beauty and the Beast and Princess and the Frog, but set in an African setting. So that means we had those Western stories. We had them many years ago in African tales as well. And 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 uh, when I read the book in the foreword, you know, and I think you mentioned it in the beginning, that that was my main inspiration with Nelson saying that he wanted these stories uh, to be heard by all the children in the world. And I thought, how are we going to let the children know about these stories? children watch animation. And that that was my inspiration to say, these were Madiba's favorites. These are, we, we grew up as children on folktales. I want to now expose our children to African folktales. Invariably, that brings me to the question of what was the situation of the African child in South Africa in pre, in appetite, you know, system and post appetite. Because when I talk to Pidoza, who's also a filmmaker and an activist, she said something about the South African child or African child generally being misrepresented. I mean, having done this job now, what's your perception, you know, of the you know situation about African child in South Africa, especially? You know, when you're thinking of African child, the first thought that comes in your mind is that photograph they show with the child with the fly on dying of hunger, you know? That's everybody's perception. Internationally, when people talk about Africa, that's what they think of. And that is what we need to break that stereotype of what an African child is. I mean, children, no matter where they are, Africa, Russia, Ukraine, anywhere, they are all the same. They just love to be told stories. They love to play. They all have the same dreams and hopes. And, and this is the mindset that we need to change when, when, when people think of the African child. They need to think of a child. Just a child, mm -hmm. you know, drop the African. You are dealing with children. They're all the same. So that brings us to the look and feel of the miniseries in terms of color, in terms of interpreting the environment, the cultural, uh, the folklore, you know, ethical values and all that. How did the, you know, wholesomeness of, in terms of color separation, shooting, production generally interpret what we might say there's a need for pro-social African child, presenting the African, the African child in good pictures. Well, I think what we wanted to do in terms of our look and feel with the African is we wanted it to be traditionally ethnic. You know, it had to show our heritage as it was in the mythical past. So when we looked at when we did our research, for example, we looked at the clothing. If I take my one story, Fasito goes to the market, it's set in Uganda. And it was at the time when there were bicycles. So when I went and looked and researched Uganda, I saw, oh, bicycles came in Uganda at this era. So what were people wearing at that time? Oh, actually, I was quite surprised to find that they were wearing traditional Muslim outfits. But because, um, but but there was very something very unique. They would wear the, the, the Muslim long dress, but they'd wear it with a suit. And, and I thought, well, this is fantastic. And we, we made sure that each one of our stories that we went to that particular time in that country and made sure that we looked at the traditional ethnic clothing that was worn and we copied that same clothing. The same thing with the backgrounds. Um, Fasito takes place in a plantation um, and the, he passes a hospital. He ends up in the market. 
So, you know, Google pictures of markets, the plant, the banana plantation, how would his father's house have looked and made sure that we were, were, were using that, that look and feel, actual look and feel of that country. The same thing with uh, the story of Snake Tea Chief. It's KZN, it's KwaZulu Natal. How were your huts? Your huts were round. What were they wearing? Traditional Zulu outfits. Um, Cloud Princess, it's set in Swaziland. So what does she wear? The feathers, not just, the, I mean, the story, Cloud Princess is set in Swaziland. Isn't it amazing? It's about birds. And what do you always see the Swazis wear? They always have feathers in their hats. So if you look at the, the, the story itself, brings forward the ethnicity of the, of the culture of the country that we are showing in, in, in the series. And, and that was the important thing that the look and feel was real. It was the actual country, the actual country's clothing, the eth ethnic clothing of that country, the ethnic background of that country that we are representing in our film. So, so then for me, children were not just being entertained, but children could also learn about their heritage and about their cultural background. I, I have no sense that when I saw Rainbow Colors, it reminded me quickly of Latin America, where rainbow colors, bright colors, are essential, you know, interpretation of their heritage in terms of drumbeat, in terms of all that kind of thing. Um, how did your choice of colors, basically, I know the original, now pull you into the global situation? The world is globalizing, so in every situation, cultures would fight to represent themselves. So how did that ethnicity or ethnic toleration pull into the global situation? How did you represent Africa in the global sense? You know, the thing is, as I said, we, we didn't want to change anything. We looked at how is the traditional clothing worn and we made sure that it was that. We didn't adapt our clothing or adapt our story so that it could appeal to a global market. We've made sure that it was authentic African. Now, I think the reason that it is being accepted in the global market is because we have a lot of people in the rest of the world that are very interested in Africa, who have their roots in Africa and who want to learn about Africa. And hence, when they saw Mandela's African folktales, they were interested in watching it from that sense of view. Also, you know, Mandela is a, is, is a, is a name that is known throughout the globe. And, and that is our unique selling point. And, and we didn't have to adapt anything for, for the global market to want to watch us. We were just African and they were interested. Very interesting. Look, you can be your authentic in terms of dialogue, in terms of costuming, in terms of mannerisms, you stand out. And when you stand out, you become unique, you become exotic, and you have that appeal. So no matter what you do, you have to be yourself in a way, you know, for you to stand out and be appreciated the way you are. The only time when you need to, um, you know, to reach out globally is when there is a co-production. So, so when you want to approach co-producers, uh, for example, if you want to get a co-producer from Paris or you want a co-producer from Europe or America, uh, for example, if you look at that typical story about um, going to America, you know, you could start in an African country, but then you end up going to America. If you look at any of the big blockbusters these days, I mean, just look at one of, uh, um, what is that guy? Mission Impossible, right? Where is he? They are shooting in five different countries. And that's the global appeal. They are going to Dubai. They are going to Europe. They are going to United States. They're ending up in Canada. So, so this is what uh, what, what you, the international global reach is, is to go into all those different countries. And these days with green screen, uh, for example, my movie, The Greatest Thing, we have a scene where she's in New York. We didn't go to New York, you know, we, we showed, we, we, we got some footage. Uh, you get lots of footage that you can buy of the taxis driving through you know, you, you, New York. Then we showed her outside a building and then, you know, we, we then were inside the building. We shot on green screen and she's in New York. But, but that's how if you, if you need the international appeal for your film, that is how you do it. You have locations in different countries and in particular, approach the country if you're approaching for example uh, Canada then you've got to have your character in Canada that's how it works but for this particular production my series you know we didn't get any international funding so we could we didn't have to change our script in order for us to have global appeal we could just tell our story the way the way it is in the book and I did try to stick 
as close to the original um, uh, folk tale as, as possible. We only deviated where we absolutely had to. You know, where it was maybe too violent, like they eating each other. <laughs> it, reminds me, it reminds me when COVID was raging and people had to do... I remember some guy told me he was doing a shooting or shoots in four locations across the world. And I was wondering how. Now you're just explaining and it's very clear to me that <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> that takes me next to the next question. How you could use locations and, you know, story to create thin line, you know, between cultures and people to, you know, uh, you know, sell your movies, you know. So, uh, do you have any individual a remarkable event as a child in your life that had always told you, you must do a movie, you must do something? You know, um, mine is actually like completely different because at the end of the day, um, my father didn't, uh, you know, when I would say I was born to be a movie star because like I can't remember a time that I didn't want to be in front of the camera, you know. And I, for ex as example, just remember as a, as a child uh, inviting all my friends down the street to come and watch me perform. And, and I had this, this pink polka dot dress on. And I remember, uh, you know, we listened to the radio uh, in, you know, that will give away my age, but there was no television then. <laughs> and we listened to the radio and I had this very vivid imagination because it was squat cars and jet jungle. And, and you had to listen to the story in order for you to imagine what was happening there. And I think listening to the radio, and, and I, I had a little record player, and the record player would we'd listen to the stories on the record player. And then came television. And the first thing that I, rem uh, the one thing that I have a vivid memory about is that I was watching a, a movie and there was Hal Berry, this woman of color on television. And I wanted to be on television. And, and my dad said to me, no, my dear, we're living in apartheid days. That's not going to happen. You know, you need to go and, you know, and get an education. There's no such thing of being in the movies. And when I was older, you know, and I finished my studies and I needed, okay, dad, I want to go and study drama. It was, no, you go and you're going to study, become a doctor, a lawyer or whatever. You're not going to be go and study drama. So um, I went and that's how I ended up being an attorney, you know, is that my father said, go and get a, a degree and then you can have something to fall back on. So, um, and, and he always said, you know, you can go and teach drama or anything, but you need to have a degree. And my father passed away um, when I was just in the my final year of my BCom. And I always say that, you know, that was the time I could possibly have hopped on a plane and flown to Hollywood. Um, and I didn't, you know, he, he wanted me to, to do the law and I wanted to honor his memory. And so I went on with my, my legal studies and registered for the LLB and I completed my, my law degree. And then when I was finished, I thought like if I worked for myself, I'd be able to have the free time to pursue my acting. And that's why then, um, well, I finished all the, you know, you have to do articles with a law firm and, and everything. And I was also very fortunate then affirmative action kicked in and I ended up getting uh, my articles at a, at a thing in property. And, and, and that was just wonderful because uh, not having to every day made it possible for me to have lots of free time, you know, because con conveyancing doesn't have that rigid uh, time frames like being in court does. And, and so I then did my diploma. I did a four year a drama diploma. I think I mentioned that earlier. I was then able to, to basically do both, you know. Uh, you know, critical events in your childhood would have, you know, spawned you into becoming a filmmaker. Uh, yeah. I mean, inevitably, inevitably, you're a naturally talented person when it comes to the arts. But you had to do your yeah. father's will. In all of this, you've been a lawyer, if you're a filmmaker, you're a philanthropist. And you reached out to people like us in Nigeria. In your conceptualization of life, what statement would you want to make to them? I, I think that the most important thing is that you do with your life something that is rewarding. You know, even my, my legal firm, the work that I've done there has always been rewarding to me. Um, I've been instrumental in providing housing to the poorest of the poor. 150,000 households we have given housing to in, in, in my law firm. Um, I've established over a hundred townships and I've given a hundred thousand, a hundred townships and I've given title deeds to almost 50,000 people. And the joy that one sees on the face of a, of an elderly lady when she gets her title deed is just so rewarding. 
So I think the most important thing in life is do something that makes you feel good about your life. And even then coming onto the, the movie side of things, once we had finished our films and I went to go and show the films to some, uh, some children on Mandela Day, and I heard their laughter, you know, because you work on this project over and over again and you just don't see it anymore. But when I heard the children laughter and they were so engaged in the film, they were even doing exactly what the Sagoma was doing in the film. They were so engaged. I, I felt so rewarded. And I thought, wow, well done, you know, even a tap on my own back. And, and that's the most important thing. And I think also in terms of my age, you know, I feel that you're never too old to start something new. If you feel like, you know, a lot of women, especially, um, you know, they would have been, oh, you have to go, or even men. I, 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 men might have had the idea that they, they wanted to do a certain, follow a certain career path, but because of commitments, of family commitments, they had to go and do a job. And now they've done that job and their children are big and they're out of the house and they're saying, oh, my life is over. No, your life is just starting. You can do that. Your production has won many awards. Could you succinctly say those awards that have, you know, given you a sense of fulfillment with that? You've won so many awards, I can't start counting them. <laughs> <You've been laughs> since... <laughs> well, it's 16. it's 16 to date because we just got another one this week. <laughs> you see? So you, yeah. you, I, I can't start counting them, but what awards, if you were to count like five, will, will wholly summarize the whole essence of your life as a philanthropist? As a lawyer, as a filmmaker, maybe you, when you wake up in the morning, oh yeah, I think I think those are the ones I really, really say uh, that give me what I wanted in life. Um, you're saying awards, eh? Or rewards? Yeah. Awards. 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 Also call them rewards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, when I started out my business, uh, very my legal business, that is, uh, very early in my life. Um, I, 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 I developed a concept that was called community orientating conveyancing, which took the conveyancing out of the sterile office of the law firm and brought it to the community. Because the work that I did wasn't just that of sitting in the office and going to court, but it was helping people in the, uh, people in the informal settlements um, uh, to, to get title deeds and to become uh, gentlemen who were working there, we would train them there and we would help them to a subsidy in order for them to qualify for their house. But in 1998, I received uh, the best con emerging conveyancing firm award. Um, and, and that was, you know, when, when it just first started, it was given to me by the Gauteng Department of Human Settlements. And then in 2003, I received an award for the uh, regional, um, it was the Business Women's Regional Achievers Award, which I got in the professional category. And in the newspaper article, it actually said for my contribution to the regional economy. And I said, really, did I do that? <laughs> you know? So that was, those are the two of the things on, on the legal side that was most rewarding. And then of course, um, when it was my very first short film, that was like amazing. I, I'm still like sometimes, we did the short film just so we could qualify for funding for a feature film. And yet it, it, it won an award. And so that, that, that was really quite rewarding to me as well when we, we won the, uh, as I said, the most outstanding short film. I won a best director short film for that film as well. And then now with, uh, with these uh, animations, I mean, this has just been absolutely incredible. I mean, best uh, 16 best animation short film awards with subcategory awards of best art director, best episode director, uh, best uh, editor, best music score, and of course, best producer. And then we got three honorable mentions. And what was really wonderful to me was an audience choice award that we received from the Manchester um, Film Festival in the United Kingdom. And then we were finalist in two festivals. We had a nominee in two festivals and overall 17 official selections. You know, that's those leaves that you get. And 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 what was still incredible for me too was just, I'm still surprised to this day, you know, that these these this recognition came from countries like the United Kingdom, United States, Australia, Germany, India, South Korea, Japan, Rome, Romania. Turkey, and then of course Africa from Egypt and Ghana. Next month our, show, our films will be showing in, in Egypt, and this month it's actually showing in Ghana. And then of course, you know, to get recognition in your own country in South Africa where our films were accepted at the Durban International Film Festival. I, I, I'm, I'm still amazed. You know, I wake up in the morning and think, has this really happened? <laughs> it's incredible. <laughs>
yeah. it's incredible. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. you've done so well. Yeah. You've been in Nigeria a few times. Yeah, yeah. One time you came to, you know, after a recognition of your job. Uh, what advice would you have for the Nigerian team industry? Well, I think Nigeria's made it. Like, can we in South Africa give Nigeria any advice? I mean, you guys, I was told about this filmmaker who made a film and uh, he was able to to get it out to um, to, uh, to so many people, and then he made ten million from the film. I thought that was like amazing. And and you know what what Nigeria has that South Africa does not have? It has people who are interested in local films. We, for example, would make a local film. We can't even get it into our cinemas because the cinemas that have to exhibit it will say nobody will come and watch your film. That's what they did to me my movie the greatest thing and 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 when i was in nigeria what i found was that the nigerian people support local films and and this was incredible to me um of course i i imagine that the nigerian uh, filmmakers would want to go international now because i think you've nailed the local market and there i think it would be about improving the quality of the films um because i think at the certain at the quality it is at now that's okay for at home but if you want to go international, they would have to be, you know, I, I laugh sometimes because we were watching a film once on television and I saw the boom. <laughs> I said, there's the boom in the picture. I didn't edit it out, you know. But it's it's but but as I said, for me the most incredible thing is the fact that that home local supports local, and we don't have that here yet in South Africa. But internationally, it would have to be lifting the standard of production so that it would be of 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 there's, there's like I was told with my fault better production value. You need more ad, but you can only do that with money, you know. I mean, I could have given them production value if they gave me a 50 million. And, and that's where the challenge comes. So you're sort of sitting with a, an egg and chicken situation. You want to be able to do films that have great production value. But in order to do that, you need money. And how do you get that one? Everybody's biggest challenge. I guess you just have to wait for that moment that something falls from heaven, that lucky break. You know? Yeah, I'm still talking to Claudia Nobularef, Tony Philanthropies and winning director and producer in she's a folklorist filmmaker as of today she's won so many awards and it's so interesting because i knew her yeah i think it was 2011 when i came down to nigeria to was it at the armor awards or the audio visual awards that Amma were in was, lagos yeah. yeah then that would have been i think maybe yeah it would have been around when i made my short film because we were nominated for an armor award Board, and we traveled up, you know, I, I know it was up north further. It wasn't in, in, in Lagos. It was further up we traveled um, to, to go to the armors. That was quite an experience. It was wonderful. I always tell everyone, it was like the African Oscars. <laughs> so, so I mean, regarding the, you know, voluminous production, apart from production value, apart from the market, have you ever thought of a co-production with Nigerian filmmaker? You know, I, I, I was at Discop and I met uh, a Nigerian uh, filmmakers and they they had this lovely project about this young man who was a singer. And, and I thought, well, oh, and, and the, I can't you know tell you the story um, just in terms of their own copyright. But it was just a, it's such a beautiful story. And, and, and it also had the element of coming to South Africa. You know, and that's what you need for a co-production, things happening in Nigeria, things happening in South Africa for a show. And I was so interested in this film and and I was talking to them and, and, and we met up and everything. But I think they thought I was too small, you know. They didn't really want to work um, with the filmmaker. Um, I was a single, you know, female filmmaker. And I think they were looking for a bigger production company to co-produce with. So it was quite disappointing because I really loved the storyline. That, that they were selling. I wouldn't see that. I shouldn't see your being a small production company as an obstacle because, I mean, if you're doing a Nigerian South African co production, you could go to America and say, This is a Nigerian South African co production, and you can make it an American Nigerian South African co production. So for me, I usually say it's a matter of trust. It's a matter of, like you did, you earn for so long, and this is where you are. I mean, so many awards. So for me, sometimes patience is a wealth, is a key to breathing in. There are three things that you must, you must possess. Patience, trust, you know, and vision of the future. If there are any Nigerian filmmakers out there, please contact me. <laughs> I work for a network, a TV network, and we have a series mm -hmm. of 
uh, projects that would like, IPs that would like now. And we're looking to making movies with co-producers. We have about six IPs that have been, we, we're tending to see if we can co-produce. We are actually looking for funding. Talking about um, skip life cycles. The National Film and Video Foundation follows the Hollywood formula of script writing. So when you get funding from them, they go through the process of you first do the treatment. So you do your treatment, it goes to the editor, the editor checks the treatment, okay, they're happy with the treatment. You then go on to step outline, and then from step outline, you can go into first draft. And we normally do about three or four drafts before we have a final draft. And then that process is to and fro between the writer and the script editor. And the important thing is, is to ensure that you have your character's journey has been plotted correctly. Because if you watch a Hollywood film, you always see it is character driven. Stories that are not character driven do not engage the audience. So it is character driven. It has an inciting incident that happened within 10, 10 minutes time. And, you know, it, 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 then you have certain things. I, I don't know all of them, but that has to happen to the character throughout the throughout their journey in that film. And so they make sure that all of those elements are in your story. And so that's not something you can whip out in two weeks, I wouldn't think, you know. I would say that you should take at least a month minimum, maybe maybe three months, you know, to make sure that all the elements are in there. And then even after a script editor is to send uh, the final draft to a script consultant. And you have a lot of international script consultants as well that would then give you further um, information um, uh, pointers on your script and, and what you can do to to improve the script. So I, I think the NAVF formula is actually really a good one. And when I receive scripts from anyone, I've got two waiting to be read. If I don't see a character journey, if there's no inciting incident, if there's no resolve for the character, if he doesn't reach his lowest point, you know, there is there, there's no story there. So and you already know that this writer just put thoughts together. Writing is not just putting thoughts together. If you want a good screenplay, you got to follow the Hollywood formula. Do you believe also believe that uh, we can have, we can have a different kind of structure in terms of the character's journey? Because I know that um, some filmmakers have had to shoot movies without actually following the Nollywood model, but then still tell a good story. Who do you want to see your film? You might think you are telling a good story. But if you mm. want to get it onto the international market, shouldn't you be following the international formula? I'm sure it's okay, maybe just for local. But if you if you want to engage your audience, and and there was you wouldn't believe it. I'm actually quite honoured about this. Um, my daughter met a, a a young girl who was studying at AFTA, and they was were doing script analysis of a film, and they were using my film Pindelia's Heart to do it. <laughs> so that was the formula because now students are actually learning from my movie. <laughs> you know? So, so I, I would not. Anybody comes to me, I'm going to want to follow the Hollywood formula. I'm not going to uh, digress. Right. I think it's a personal choice because, as I said, I allowed the digress. And what did I end up with? Well, not, you know, the last, well, last question. Uh, in all of these, in all of these fulfillments and happiness and awards and everything. What have you done? What impact have you had on the South African film industry as it is? I, I, well, no, I don't think I've arrived anywhere because I haven't made the big blockbuster yet. Oh. <laughs> I, think I, need, I think I need to do the blockbuster. You know, I need to have a film, a feature film that opens at opening night um, at, at Durban International Film Festival or closes the film festival to have made any mark in South Africa as a filmmaker. I think I'm still seen as, um, you, you know, no, the, the, you need to have a feature film behind your name. I think that's really important. And the one I have was not, was not a blockbuster. So, you know, I'm hoping that this film that I'm working on now, the one that is called The Dam, it's about a, a tragedy that happened in 1985. So it's inspired by true events that happened in South Africa. And um, and it's the one that we're co-producing with the Netherlands. And I think that this one, once that film is done, then I can say, well, I've made my mark as a filmmaker in South Africa. Um, I think that at the moment I'm still, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think so. But a lot of people who tell me, no, gosh, look how many films you've made. But I, I think that I can only, I personally, will feel that I've achieved something once I have the feature film behind my name. You just said you're going to reflect a real life event in a movie. How should Africans use movies 
to tell, the, to expose the fabric of our history, of our values, of who we are, our identity and dignity. And the important thing to have when you're doing that is a good script. Because when I started off with this particular uh, film that I'm, I'm talking about, um, we did a, try to approach co-producers. And at that time, we were telling the story from a completely different perspective. And just in changing the perspective in which you were telling the story landed us the co-production afterwards, you know. So uh, it's not just the it's not just the subject matter, but the angle from which you portray that subject matter that makes a difference as to whether you're going to be able to tell a good story and 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 to reflect those values in the story that you are telling. So I, I think um, it, it's it's really important to to actually tell stories historical stories of events that took place, but you have to do it from the perspective of somebody who experienced that, that history. Because if you're just telling the facts, it's a documentary. But if you take one character and you tell the, 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 the story from the perspective of that character and follow that character's journey within the historical event, That's right. That's right. then you have a movie. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Thank you so much. It's a nice talking to you, uh, Claudia Nobela uh, Arev, Anthony Philanthropist, award winning director and producer of uh, Nelson Mandela's Foreign African Folk Tales mini series, selection mini series. Uh, you can find us on Instagram and uh, Facebook. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you for you, you all all <laughs> Thank you to your company. I'm really privileged to have been uh, given this opportunity to chat with you. And thank you to you for the wonderful work that you're doing out there and for exposing us as filmmakers and giving us the opportunity to tell our stories to the world. Thank you.